Welcome everyone to the Green Chemistry Education Webinar Series hosted by the Green Chemistry Commitment. Again, my name is Amy Cannon and I'm the Executive Director of Beyond the Nine, a nonprofit dedicated to green chemistry education in K-12 through, through higher ed. Um, this webinar series is designed to highlight relevant topics in green chemistry education for faculty and students who are looking to adopt more green chemistry in their courses and programs. So as a reminder, we are um, broadcasting live and recording the session, so all attendees are in listen-only mode and all lines are muted. If you do have a question, feel free to submit it or type it right into the question box, the question or chat box on your control panel, and we'll have a look at them and we'll respond to as many questions as we can after this presentation. The recording will be posted, um, it'll be available on our YouTube channel by the end of today and you'll receive an email of the recording as well with supporting documents. Um, for those of you who uh, participate in social media, please feel free to connect with us on Twitter or Facebook. We'd love to hear some live tweeting going on. So here are some of our Twitter um, handles and hashtags. So thank you so much for joining this webinar and for taking part in this discussion. So this webinar is being brought to you as part of the Green Chemistry Commitment Program, which is a consortium program aimed at uniting the green chemistry community to bring more resources to departments looking to adopt green chemistry and also just to improve com connections and facilitate discussion um, around green chemistry and implementing these in higher ed. If you're interested in more information, feel free to connect with us on our website or, or email us directly. As part of the webinar series, we always give away a, a green chemistry book at the conclusion of each webinar. So we'll announce a randomly selected winner from our list of attendees at the end of the webinar and we'll send the book back to you, uh, directly out to you. So the winner will receive an email from us requesting your contact information immediately following the, this webinar. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce our, our our uh, speakers today, we have two speakers, which is very exciting for us, and I think a very relevant topic. So we'll be talking to you today about teaching toxicology and chemistry programs. And we'll be looking at two different models from Green Chemistry Commitment Signer Schools in particular. Um, it's a really interesting topic. Uh, faculty are, are figuring out how to adopt and, and integrate green chemistry in many different ways, or I'm sorry, toxicology in many different ways. So we'll first hear from Dr. James Wallach, who's an associate professor at St. Catharines University. Um, he, uh, both of our speakers actually have extensive green chemistry experience in both research and education. Um, Dr. Dr. Wallach received his PhD from the University of Minnesota and his undergrad at St. John's University, also in Minnesota. Um, and also Dr. Megna Dillip, she's an associate professor at Worcester State University also with extensive experience in green chemistry education. Um, and she comes to us with a PhD from the University of Alabama and then her undergraduate work in India. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, first have James um, present on, on his their model at uh, St. Catharines University and then we'll hear from Magna and then we'll, we'll pause at the end to take questions from the audience. But again, feel free to type in a question. We'll be gathering them throughout the discussion. So with that, I'm going to hand over the controls to James. Did you get anything, James? Let me see. Let me try that again. There we go. There we go. Now you should see it. Good. Wonderful. Looks good. All right. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to thank everyone um, from GCC for the invitation. Um, I'm not a toxicologist in any right, and I appreciate all the resources they provided in order to help me educate myself and then educate uh, eventually my students in this very important topic. Um, so when I start, I want to talk a little bit about our university. So we're in St. Paul, Minnesota. We're founded by the Sisters of St. Joseph. There's none left on faculty anymore. The last one left a couple years ago, but we are still uh, uh, pertinent to their mission. Uh, we have about 5,000 students with the largest proportion being um, in our undergraduate day program. Um, we're the largest women's college in the United States. 
and we're part of a consortium called the ACTC, the Associated Colleges of the Twin Cities, and that's um, Hamlin, McAllister, St. Thomas, and Augsburg, so that's nice we can share resources and bounce ideas because we're all within five miles of each other. Our particular department graduates about 10 chemistry majors a year, and because of that, um, it's really difficult for us to offer a standalone course in chemical toxicology. So we had to um, be more creative in our approach in doing that um, after we signed the, the Green Chemistry Commitment. And the nice thing about the Green Chemistry Commitment is that um, the tox the, all the portions are flexible, so we can decide how we want to implement it into our curriculum. And so when we started out, um, we looked at what we actually signed up for, and that was the learning objectives. And when we saw the toxicology portion, we were like, well, we talked a little bit about principles already in our general chemistry and our organic chemistry, along with identifying and assessing molecular hazards. So like when you look up um, hazards um, and MSDSs and so on. The one thing we really didn't have in our curriculum, which um, didn't satisfy the learning objectives, was that we didn't um, talk about molecular mechanisms. And when I think about toxicology, and I'm biased because I'm an organic chemist, I think that's the most interesting part because um, you're actually applying organic chemistry to why things are toxic. And that's what's also interesting to students is because we know a lot of things are toxic. I can name a bunch of toxic substances and everyone's like, ooh, they're toxic, but we don't really know why. And so once we actually see the chemistry of that, um, it, it creates really lifelong learning experiences um, of not just understanding why they're toxic, but it makes you a better chemist. So since we couldn't offer our own standalone course, when I talked to my faculty um, in my department, um, I, I suggested that we make it our, our seminar topic every other spring. By doing it every other spring, it made sure that um, all of our junior and senior chemistry majors um, had access to um, um, molecular mechanisms in toxicology. Our seminar meets every Friday for 65 minutes, and we rotate topics. Um, so our topics that we usually rotate between are green chemistry, toxicology, polymers, and nanomaterials. Um, in seminar, our juniors give one 15-minute seminar on a research article each, each um, year, and our seniors give two 15-minute research um, um, seminars each year. Um, in addition to journal presentations by students, like a journal club, we also have outside speakers related to the topic. Uh, what's really nice for us here um, in St. Paul is that the University of Minnesota is right down the road, and they have several toxicologists there, as well as um, access to toxicologists in local in industry and government. So, for instance, this spring we're having two speakers from Minnesota and one speaker from the Minnesota Pollution Control. All right. So, um, once we decided to implement this approach, um, we did it the first time we did it was um, two springs ago. We have the students come in and we explain why we chose toxicology. Um, and we say it's part of our commitment um, to the Beyond B9 and green, and green Chemistry. And they're, all our students are really excited about that. So um, they, they have instant buy-in that they want to fulfill this commitment that our department has signed up for um, pertinent to their education. And um, after we explain why we do it, then we um, recap the fundamental principles they've learned in previous coursework. That includes how hazards are assessed. I'll show some examples um, from some slides we give on the, the first day. And um, we also um, review um, a fundamental toxicology theory. Um, and then we go through the format. Every student picks a, a toxin from a list. I'll explain um, how I got um, the list of toxins later in the seminar. And they have to give background on that toxin. Um, that includes where it's found and used and how toxic is it. And so then that way they can directly re relate those hazards that they found in the literature or online um, to the toxicity level. And then students see those same types of parameters over and over throughout the year, so it, it gets ingrained um, in, into their minds. And then after that, we, um, we make sure that they present possible mechanisms of why the compound's toxic. This is kind of interesting because um, sometimes the mechanism isn't known, and the students get freaked out about that because um, there's only plausible mechanisms and there's only some, some information. So that really brings more awareness to why toxicology is such an important topic and why we should spend more time um, um, on it. And then sometimes we can, uh, they'll find stuff on methods of detoxification. So if you're poisoned, 
can you reverse it? Or sometimes there's a chemical that's used, but there's alternative chemicals that can be used instead. So this kind of is where it relates back to green chemistry. And then the important thing is when the, the students do their, do their seminar, they do all that background, and then they actually take a primary literature reference that studied the, the toxin. And they do this by taking a research article from the journal Chemical Research and Toxicology. It's important that we use this particular journal because if we just let them choose an article from any journal, they'll get a lot of medical studies, like we fed the toxin to rats and this is how toxic it was. And when they do that, there's really no mention of the chemis chemistry. So it's not a biology course, it's a chemistry course. So that's why we have to talk more about the mechanisms of toxicology. And this is what this journal is dedicated to. Um, and so we review how, since they're juniors and seniors and they're still learning how to use primary literature, we review how to access that journal directly. And since most program, so many programs are ACS certified, and this is a, an ACS journal. And then we draw for topics, and then we also draw for a presentation date because nobody wants to go first. Um, so we start out with the background. So this is the, the fundamental theory and vocabulary of toxicology. They've, they've seen much of this already in their, um, their organic chemistry course um, because they have to do green chemistry projects there. So we talk about hazard and risk, um, acute hazards versus chronic hazards. Um, we talk about different ways that we can assess, ha assess hazards. So there's the National Fire Protection Association guides. Um, so um, this, this, this is pertinent to them in their real day life because when they're behind a, a, a truck carrying certain chemicals, they see this. Um, and so um, it, it helps them be more aware um, as they're like driving down the street and it brings their chemistry back. Um, we talk about different types of hazards, uh, chemical, biological, physical. Um, most of the topics that we choose are of the chemical uh, nature, um, so they're, they're usually uh, organic compounds. But every now and then, somebody, if somebody wanted to do a protein or an enzyme that um, they knew uh, was toxic, we, we would allow them. But we stay away from the corrosive um, compounds because they just essentially just rip your skin apart, so there's, there's not much mechanism there. Um, then we, we talk about carcinogen, tumor promoter, mutagen, teratogen. Um, and then I always joke when, when we do this because we're like, oh, it's a class 4 mutagen. It's so dangerous. Well, if you know what you're talking about, it's really not. And so they think that's, that's a funny joke. I always say at the end there. Um, and then we had to learn the new GHS pictograms a few years back. And so we re review those again. Um, all of our students... Um, already have seen these in, in um, general chemistry and organic chemistry because we make them take a safety quiz and on that safety quiz they have to review all of these and so uh, we cover them again here and so that helps us fulfill those two portions of the toxicology equipment assessing hazard um, and then finally we talk a little bit about the mechanisms in, in toxicology um, so I'm not an expert in toxicology so the past two years maybe I've spent I don't know maybe 80 or 100 hours researching, and I keep on seeing the same themes over and over. And when I looked at these topics, they, they, they end up seeing these themes as well. So a lot of the chemicals that they choose will mutate DNA, and then that causes protein misfolding, or maybe it mutates, uh, mutates a repair enzyme, and then the DNA is not fixed. Um, sometimes they, they find interesting things about once the chemical's in their body, it gets converted to something else, and then they'll tell stories about that. Um, and that something else is more toxic or something else that's less toxic. And so there's, there's good and bad there. Um, a lot of the toxins they come across will react with proteins or enzymes and causes them to lose their, um, 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 lose their effect. Um, and the thing I think is really, really cool about this, especially since I'm an organic chemist, is even though students um, aren't taking a full course in toxicology, they can understand the mechanisms because many of the basic mechanisms of chemical toxicology are fundamental mechanisms that they learn in their organic chemistry 2 course. Um, so like shift phase formation or Michael addition. Um, and um, they see those over and over. And so not only do they learn something new, toxicology, but they also get to review their organic chemistry and it makes it stick. And then it also makes it more real for them because they've drawn those mechanisms and it makes them um, think more about structures um, here's the, um, the, the cover slide. 
that I give when we, we, we do this on the first day. And on it, I put all the, the, the topics that they can choose from. And so uh, people are really excited when they come in because they, you know, there's, there, there's something exciting about the fear of, of many of these substances. So, um, and then they're always, they're always jockeying for position like, oh, I, would, I hope I pick first and so on. So that creates a sense of excitement um, about the topic. Um, so here I've pre pre uh, prepared some like examples of what a student might do um, around the goals that they have to do in the seminar. So um, they, first they have to give some background and then they have to talk a little bit about the mechanism and then after that they actually present the, the primary literature journal article that goes in more depth of how their toxin is studied. Um, so um, where is it found or how is it synthesized? So here's an example of arsenic. All right, so a student would look up arsenic and they were like, well, arsenic in and of itself, all right, maybe not the worst carcinogen, but if it's arsenite, then it's, it's worse. And if it's arsenate, it's even, even worse than that. So then they realize that it's just not arsenic itself that we should be worried about, it's other forms. And um, you can think about that for a lot of different toxin. It's not the original toxin, it, maybe it's something else it turns into. Um, and then the, a student that would look at this would also find there's different methylated forms of arsenic um, that would be present in your body, and each of those methylated forms have different uh, various toxicity levels. So it helps students think of the, 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 the long-term picture. Um, and then after that, they, um, they have to discuss why their compound is toxic, and this is where the mechanisms come into play. So in this particular example, um, the arsenate um, re reacts with um, lipoic acid, and and when this is, lipoic acid is uh, attached to uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, it d diminishes its uh, its catalytic activity, and so you can you can easily draw a mechanism where um, that the electrons here will, or I'm sorry, where the sulfurs will coordinate to the arsenic, so you can see how that actually would happen, and also this this. This gives us real life examples of how chemicals can affect us in real everyday life. Because everybody has to like memorize the citric acid cycle and you always wonder why you're doing it when you're doing it. But here you can actually see where if, if I don't have the pyru pyruvic dehydrogenase because I have arsenic poisoning, um, then this whole, whole thing stops and then I lose energy. And so that, that really drives home uh, why they should be worried. Um, another interesting theme that people come across is that it's usually not just one single mechanism or toxic effect. When they look up their, their, their chemical, they will often see that maybe there's multiple pathways of toxicity. Um, so another one for this particular um, hazard, or this particular toxin, ars arsenate, um, it ends up it can act as kind of like phosphate. And so students can look at these and they say, ooh, <laughs> the chemical structures of those do look pretty similar. And so it helps people kind of classify um, structure with um, toxic toxicity or hazard class. And so in, in this particular example, um, if, if you re replace a, a, a phosphate with an arsenate, um, in this step of glycolysis, it, it, can, it can hinder the process. And so now it's, it's, it's um, calling back to some of the biochemistry that you've learned earlier or that they're going to take eventually. So it strengthens their overall curriculum in that regard. Um, and you can't do this for all of them, but we tell them to try to figure out if there's a way that you can avoid it. So kind of like doing green chemistry, like is there an alternative? Or if there's a method of detoxification. So again, with arsenic, arsenic it's a good example because um, if you treat it with 2,3-dimercaptyl uh, propanol, um, it can kick off the, the arsenic and then you get your free thiols back and then the catalytic activity of the, of the enzyme is restored. All right. Um, other mechanism examples, so these future examples won't be directly related to my, my arsenic slides, but I just want to show how the, the beauty of arcanic chemistry can easily uh, be seen to show how some of these molecules are toxic. Um, one thing a lot of chemicals do is they create uh, reactive ox oxygen species, and the byproduct of those reaction oxidative species are, are um, toxic chemicals. So one example of this is MDA. So this showed up, and when I've done a review of a lot of um, toxin, this, this molecule showed up over and over again. And so this is really nice because uh, when you cover organic chemistry and you talk about shift bases or imines, um, 
you're kind of like, well, why do we really use those? Well, where they actually really do come into, um, into play is in biological systems. And so this is beautiful right here, like the nucleophilic addition. People can see that again, and then they see proton transfer, and then they say nucleophilic elimination. So it's driving home that organic chemistry, and it's showing how, here's a, a, a protein down here, can get modified by um, aldehydes. And so this one's um, especially interesting because it can do it twice because it's a dialdehyde. So I can do this whole process on one side and I can do the whole process on the other side. And for this to fall apart, essentially both of them would have to come off. And by the time one comes off, another one can come back on. Um, and so they can actually see the arrows moving. So it puts their organic chemistry um, to life with a real life purpose. Um, Here's another nice example of uh, DNA addicts. So that's another thing um, that is a common, um, a common mechanism of toxicity. So here's the DNA base. It can also react with the MDA. And um, it also um, can form an imine. And then eventually we get a DNA addict, which then can um, uh, mis misread um, uh, when it's in the ribosome. Um, I just want to stop here for a second and say the reason I go through some of these, these examples is is that it gives students a basis for what to look for. So not everyone's going to see a microaddition or an imine formation. But when they do come across it, they can go back and look at, um, look at the slides from our first lecture and be like, oh, I've seen this before. And it gives them more confidence moving forward. Because otherwise, when they see the word microaddition in the, the primary literature, that might sound familiar to them, but they don't, they don't trust their knowledge as much. Um, so it kind of gives them a base. Um, so here's a, an example of a mic Michael acceptor. So um, this here's acrolein um, can react with cysteines um, in uh, proteins in your body, and this is kind of interesting too because after the 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 first bit of addition, you end up getting a, an imine formation on the other side. So this shows them that many of the mechanisms are are common as well. Um, this this um, can also do DNA. Adduction. And so here's a nice example after the DNA addict is formed. I'm sorry, over here is after it's formed. And this is how the DNA would want to pair, and this is how it doesn't. So um, it gives, uh, gives a chemical meaning to um, why this is a problem. And then when something has chemical meaning, um, it, I, think, I feel like students pay more attention to it. They don't just say, that's toxic. Once they have a mechanism why, it's more true, true, uh, true to their heart near and dear. So I just want to recap a little bit more about the, the types of journal articles. So again, make sure you um, choose, choose your topics wisely and you give your students the resources. So you could choose papers directly for them to report on if you want, but I found that the Chemical Research and Toxicology Journal um, is really good um, in that regard. It also helps reinforce some of their analytical chemistry skills because a lot of the studies to figure out why a substance is toxic relies on like mass spectrometry. Um, and other um, other um, other instruments um, that they the, they see in their upper division curriculum, so that's nice. Um, I you, you you all have a copy of of this uh, slideshow, and so you can see the toxins I've selected. But it's a good idea to um, if you have other ideas for toxins you'd want to assign is to type it in um, to make sure there are um, um, journal articles in that journal because um, there's some there's some um, toxins I've typed in and there's only like one or two choices for a student to pick from and so that's not a good starting point. So all the ones I have on the on my cover slide a few slides back um, are good places to start and I've confirmed that um, there's good papers that students will be able to present on in that regard. Um, some warnings um, is that you should warn students that there might be some ambiguity relying, relying on the toxicity of their compound. So example BPA so they'll see, see some studies where BPA isn't toxic, and they'll see some studies where the chemistry shows that it, that it is. And so um, that, that, makes pe that makes students think more critically about chemistry. And this is where I tell, tell students that, yeah, chemistry is a science, but in many regards it's also a liberal art. It, it teaches you how to think. And when something's a liberal art, you have to look at things from different points of view. And both points of view might be correct. Um, and it's up to us as, as scientists and, and, and people that, that are educated to take that information and, and um, categorize it to come to our own conclusions. Um, other more striking things is sometimes the mechanism is not known. So we know it's toxic, but we don't know why. This can give students some alarm. 
and it also makes them um, more attached to the topic um, in terms of like maybe activism. Like maybe we should maybe we should be studying things more, and maybe we should we should be investing more resources to make sure things are safe. And a lot of a lot of students are progressive in, in those thoughts and regards. So this topic can um, um, really really uh, hammer home to them. Um, Another another side effect uh, educationally to this is it forces students to look up multiple articles, and so um, in the beginning of each of these CR chemical research and toxicology articles, the background sections always are citing um, other studies that actually um, reported the toxicity, and so or the mechanism or other studies on the mechanism of the toxicity. So in order to do their introduction slides, which which are usually like three or four slides, they'll have to go look up those articles as well to get the background information. Um, when I've done other topics for seminar besides toxicology, I, I don't see as many students having to look up multiple sources to get the whole picture. And so this mimics the actual progress that I do as a research scientist um, in, a, in a better fashion. And so that was a, that was the positive side effect. Um, it gives students ownership over their chemical, um, so we're not all an expert in every chemical and why it's toxic, but the student that went and did that research um, is kind of looked at as the pseudo-expert, and so other students will talk to them about it, and especially after the first couple go, and they see that maybe there's some similar uh, similarities to why their chemical is toxic, then it creates kind of like peer learning groups where they, they can, they, they can build, build off of. Um, it opens up conversations due to interest, like um, sarin gas, super toxic, it's, but it's super interesting. Um, uh, like uh, uh, teratotoxins, toxins, like from puffer fish and things like that. Um, that's that's super interesting to students. Also, there's like there's like social problems that we we come across, like vaccination um, and or or uh, arsenic in water. And so it can make the make our course more pertinent to what we see in the news as well. Um, and my favorite thing uh, about having toxicology as the journal topic is it really reinforces um, students' organic chemistry and their biochemistry. And um, even though we all want our students to be educated in toxicology, at the end of the day, you know, they're getting a chemistry degree. And the more green chemistry that we can incorporate and the more toxicology we can incorporate, it helps give real, exa real examples of to how you can apply chemistry. And it makes um, our chemistry majors better chemists. And I really, I really feel that's the case um, by incorporating um, this, uh, this journal format and also incorporating green chemistry across our curriculum. So green chemists make better chemists. So John Warner says that all the time. And I agree with him 100%. And that's kind of a, a little motto we have around here. Um, I just want to have some acknowledgments. Um, oh, there's lots of students have been been um, involved in green chemistry research projects at our institution, and because there's that interest, it helps me get buy-in from other faculty in, in our department. Um, a couple of the older faculty were more a little bit more resistant to this change, but all it takes is a critical mass to get, get gets things going, and and then eventually you can get buy-in. So by 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 telling the faculty that well we only have, we are only going to do this every other year, but everyone's still going to get um, exposed to it, and we don't have to offer another course. That went a long way to getting um, departmental buy-in. So you can always start the stakes high and say, "Yep, we want a standalone course," and then you can negotiate down to, "Well, we can put it in our seminar," and the students will still benefit and they'll still get the basics because even if you have a standalone course, you're still not going to know all toxicology. And so uh, we really just need students to be educated in a way where they can think critically about toxicology, and uh, a seminar format can do that. Um, I want to thank the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, for funding. So they, they funded this curriculum change in our department, and they gave me the time to go look up all these examples. Um, and I just showed some of them that I, I share with the students when we um, introduce this um, topic. And I just want to thank all the, the mentors um, and the facilitators in my career that have pushed me towards green chemistry and toxicology. So Dr. Wissinger at the University of Minnesota, um, she's the first one to get me involved in green chemistry. Um, Al from the Minnesota Pollution Control, he's reviewed grants and he's been a good resource. Tim Kastner has uh, been an inspiration whenever I need someone to talk to students about green chemistry and in industry. Um, he always, he's always willing to come and talk. He's from Avita. My, my PhD research advisor, Mark DiStefano, always gave me the time to pursue other interests. 
And I just want to thank uh, Minnesota Green Chemistry Forum, Beyond Behind, and the ACS Green Chemistry Summer School for giving me the resources to, to do what I do here at St. Catherine University as far as materials um, and inspiration. So thank you. Wonderful, James. Thank you so much. Um, I also love that you have found that it's, it's uh, you know, creating a, a good or making, having students get a deeper understanding of the chemistry. So oftentimes we think of this as something that's added a, an extra thing, but if reinforcing the concept, I think it's a really nice message. So thank you so much. Um, okay, so now we're going we're gonna to hear from Magna Dillif at Worcester State University. And then, like I said, feel free to type in any questions that you have. We will, if, if you did have some specifically for James, then we'll, we'll gather those and, and get those out to him at, um, right after Magna's presentation. So, Magna. And you might not be unmuted. Thank, there you thank you, Amy, for uh, inviting me to this and, and allowing me to share what we do at Worcester State um, in terms of uh, weaving toxicology into our curriculum. So just a little bit about our university. We're really close to uh, where Amy is, we're 50 miles west of uh, Boston. We have uh, a lot of colleges in Worcester, and Worcester State is one of the uh, state institutions. We have approximately 5,000 full-time students and um, more uh, interest in chemistry because people want to go into pharmacy or biotech uh, type fields. Um, most of our students are, are um, working in addition to going to school, and so that's sort of our uh, demographic. We're really proud about how we have incorporated green chemistry into our curriculum here at Western State. Um, I was hired as sort of a green chemist, so even before I joined in 2008, we had green chemistry as part of our organic chemistry curriculum. But uh, we've also introduced this environmental chemistry and green chemistry track for our chemistry majors. So this shows up uh, a student who completes uh, two of these courses, that's environmental chemistry and green chemistry, and any of the other electives uh, receives this concentration on their degree. And so we've been able to offer, uh, as upper level electives, uh, environmental chemistry, a standalone green chemistry course. and uh, Fortunately, we already had this on, our, on the book, so we didn't have to go out of our way to create it, which was the environment or toxicology. I, I think it was there as part of the biotech program, or somebody had put it in because they had an interest, and so it was just sitting there uh, when uh, Jeff and I decided we were going to teach it. Um, so because we have this concentration, there are different cases where toxicology is introduced. So for environmental chemistry, we use uh, the Bard and Kahn book, and there's a chapter on that on toxic heavy metals. Um, so oftentimes I get to it, and we talk about it, but basically it's more of a scare than a solution-based approach. So people are aware that arsenic is harmful or lead is harmful, and the focus is, well, differences in oxidation states, differences in chemical um, Farms can influence toxicity, but beyond that, there's very little toxicity introduced. Um, we do have standalone green chem for three credits. Uh, there's one module on toxicity, so it's basically about a week or two of toxicity. Um, the course itself is taught using peer-reviewed papers, and so uh, we use a, a paper that talks about uh, the quantitative structural assessment of uh, toxicity. So basically looking at a molecule in parts and then adding up those parts to give the overall toxicity. So we look at a paper like that. Um, I also show them an AIM demo, which is, again, similar sort of concept. It's a tool uh, to kind of predict toxicity right at the beginning rather than after. So if uh, your molecule sort of looks similar to caffeine, then the analog identification will tell you it's an analog of caffeine and uh, sort of help you predict its toxicity. The other big push that I have in green chemistry is distinguishing between biodegradability and toxicity. 
Oftentimes what happens is as we try to increase biodegradability, we also increase toxicity, which is sort of counter of what we want to do. And so um, there are certain structural modifications, like for instance, adding a uh, simple oxygen into your structure that will uh, keep the toxicity as is, but increase biodegradability. The other big push is, well, something can be toxic, but if it does degrade, or if it doesn't have a method of getting into the human body, then it doesn't matter if it's toxic. So a classic example of this and a classic example of great green chemistry is are these solvents which are switchable. And so um, these are on-demand recyclable solvents. You only produce them when needed by adding carbon dioxide and then you recycle them back to uh, the original component by removing the carbon dioxide. In this case, toxicity doesn't matter because you don't envision the solvent to be released into the environment anytime soon. You don't envision it being thrown away, and so it's, it's an eternal recycling solution. Um, some of my students got together, it was a, a, a lab class, and so they looked at this particular New York Times article on per perfect nails, poison workers, and uh, it, it chronicled, this particular article chronicled uh, the sort of dirty business of the nail industry. Um, so the students wanted to look at what are nail polish removers and if the nail polish removers can cause health effects, and if so, at what levels will they cause health effects? We looked at three different nail polish removers. One is a regular acetone-based, one is the ethyl acetate, and one is this thing that we got on Amazon, which is called the body pure. Um, efficacy is a big deal, uh, and so uh, they tested efficacy, seeing how good these nail polish removers were. We looked at these nail polish removers using IR, and obviously there's a discussion that even if you were going to have something new like Body Pure, it still had to have the same um, sort of functional groups because light dissolves light. Um, but if you compare the acetone to the Body Pure or the ethyl acetate, you see that the toxicity numbers are sort of similar. What is different is the vapor pressure. So essentially with the adipates which are in the um, Body Pure, you see see that the vapor pressure is not high enough that they don't get into the air and so you can't breathe them in and even though their toxicity is, is comparable to acetone or ethyl acetate, now the workers are not breathing them in and that's how you're tackling the toxicity issue. So we also did this uh, back of the envelope calculation as to how much you should be able to ingest in order for these um, nail polish removers to be toxic and it turns out it's about 38 liters, it's oral. Uh, as opposed to anything else. So it's different than inhalation, but it does um, point out the different types of uh, modes of entry do make a difference. It also points out that 38 liters seems like a lot, so you're not going to suffer the sort of chronic ailments that nail workers were suffering in the article, but uh, overuse, working in uh, closed environments, etc., will cause um, long-term effects. Um, it also brings up the interesting discussion of what do we do. Um, so do we boycott nail salons because these nail polish removers and nail products are so bad for the actual workers? Uh, or do we, do we still go and what are the costs of these alternatives, etc.? cetera? And, and so it makes for an interesting discussion. So this is the, a standalone environmental toxicology class that we taught, uh, Jeff and I. Um, uh, it's a three-credit course. It's touched upon in the other classes that I talked about, but uh, it does water into separate course, and since it's existed in the Worcester State curriculum, it sort of made sense. Uh, it was co-taught with the biochemist, who's Jeff, and uh, we used this text called Principles of Toxicology by Karen Stein and Brown, which I would recommend. Um, we also used additional resources such as the Poison Paradox, and which is a general interest uh, toxicity book, and also we took a chapter out of Environmental Chemistry by Van Loon and Duffy, which talks about the uh, transport of toxins through the environment. 
Uh, these are sort of the topics that we covered. We kind of divided them based on our expertise. So Jeff took most of the biotransformation and toxicokinetics, which I wasn't very familiar with. Uh, I'm more of an environmental chemist, so I'm more interested in what happens to the chemical in, uh, in the environment and will it have the opportunity to actually cause harm to, uh, to an organism. Uh, two two in-class exams, a final exam, some traditional homework, and then uh, similar to what James does, we did have a final presentation and a summary paper. Um, and so students were able to pick their own topics and they were, uh, I have in the next slide some of the sort of uh, representative topics that people took. One thing I should mention was that because of the makeup of our department, um, that most of our students are biochemistry, biotechnology oriented. There was a lot of interest for this particular toxic toxicology course, so we were completely enrolled at 25 students. And it's a, for us, it was a great uh, way to get the biochemists and the biotechnologists into sort of the green chemistry, um, which would otherwise they would not be exposed to green chemistry. Um, Co-teaching did was a huge help for me. Uh, because I wasn't familiar with all the material. Uh, there was a large enrollment for the first time that we were teaching it, and so there's still a lot of work to do, but it was definitely uh, something to look forward to. Uh, this is sort of the things that I was kind of interested in. Uh, so given a particular structure and given the properties of that particular molecule, how far will it travel in the environment and what negative consequences will it have. Uh, so for instance, uh, what is, uh, if, if the solubility is very, very low, then it is not going to move in water, but rather going to probably accumulate in sediments. And so you can uh, estimate movement and toxicity based on that type of information. So the sample presentation topics, the students had to choose a toxin or a class of toxins with a similar sort of mode of uh, uh, action. They had to discuss toxic mechanisms. They could be doing risk assessments. They could have chosen a carcinogen, in which case they would talk about uh, the mechanism of the, car uh, the carcinogen. Uh, some students would talk about the prevalence in the environment and take, say, for example, lead and, and talk about where it might be found and what the risks might be. Uh, and so some of the topics that uh, were discussed, such as the risk assessment of isoretinone, which is uh, acne medication, or the toxicity of ta talcum powder, which is used in babies, or dioxins and lead were some of the moderate topics that were discussed. Um, we do have a chapter out uh, that talks uh, holistically about what we offer at Worcester State. Uh, we offer a green chemistry standalone course as well as a non-majors paper and plastics course, and so this is a shameless plug for the chapter that we wrote. Um, unlike other departments, I think our department has uh, a, um, a complete buy-in on green chemistry. We've always been focused on stuff like this, so I'd like to thank my department for all the support. Um, uh, Jeff for co-teaching the course and putting up with me, and uh, Worcester State as well is very invested in uh, green chemistry and green chemistry efforts, not only in the chemistry department, but through campus-wide through sustainability activities. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Magna. Um, that was fantastic. Two really good uh, different models. So um, I love the approach. We have a student-led course, and we have an independent course that's co-taught. So that's um, really interesting to have both of those. Um, so thank you both. That was fantastic. So what I'm going to do is make myself a presenter here again. And here we are. OK. So with that, um, I'd love to say if, or ask if there are any questions. We've got. Um, I see one that came in from Glenn Hurst out over in the UK at the Center for Green Chemistry, um, or the Green Chemistry Center of Excellence. So thank you so much, Glenn, for tuning in from across the pond. Um, this is for you, James. Um, thanks, James. Can you say a little bit more about the challenges you faced when attempting to evoke change in your department, 
specifically in terms of introducing the toxicology component of green chemistry within the curriculum and how you overcame these challenges. Um, so when the, signing the green chemistry commitment helped us do that. So since, since they all thought it was a good idea that we sign it, um, I don't think they paid too much attention to exactly what we had to do. It's not, it's not overburdensome. But now that we, now when I say I want to try something new or add something or change something, then I can always use that document um, to go back and say, well, this is what we say we believe, so we have to show how we're doing these things. And so um, that, that, that helped a lot when, when I wanted to make changes. And so when, when, we had, when we needed to add toxicology, it was its own subcomponent. And so we need to do it somehow, so we have to figure out exactly how we're going to do it. Um, so Great. it's kind of like nobody's against toxicology, nobody's against green chemistry, so it, you can kind of use that as leverage. Um, because yeah. if, they, if they start speaking out against it, we'd be like, well, this is, this is what we believe. Don't you believe in that? And so that, that helped. There wasn't a ton of resistance, but um, yeah. having Beyond B9 have the materials ready, with a, a mission statement was was what really pushed helps me push things through. Well, that's good. Thanks. Um, I imagine having that sort of message that it's reinforcing some of the chemistry concepts that they're in making them better chemists. It might be also a strong, um, I guess, argument for <laughs> or a strong reason why people might see this as a good reason to do it. Um, so um, I had a. I had a question for both of you, and I've got I've got another couple questions up here too. Um, how has the student feedback been for your courses? Oh, I, I can go first if you want. Uh, for my green chemistry course, I, 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 which I've taught more a number of times, I, I believe that students actually see the relevance of chemistry, and, and so it's been uh, positive and. Uh, Definitely, uh, uh, people actually like the case studies, like the industrial success stories, and so on. And as evidenced by the enrollment in the toxicology, I think it, it, you know students are interested in those types of topics. Yeah, great. So, um, at St. Kate's, we do exit exit interviews with all of our graduating students. One of our exit interview questions is um, how they feel prepared to use green chemistry and if they feel like they're educated on toxicology. In those exit interviews, um, the students do bring up how they, uh, they appreciated having toxicology as a seminar topic and that they feel like they have a better understanding of it. Um, that being said, you have to be careful with this process because if a student picks a poor research article um, as, their, um, as what they want to present, then they can have a negative experience. So um, you have to make sure that whoever the faculty mentor is um, for that student to help them through the article um, um, has buy-in, and you have to make sure students um, start way in advance. So um, and then I'm not an expert in toxicology, but I tell my department if there's a problem, if you don't know something, I'll help figure it out. So then they send the student to me. Great, um, fantastic, um, Magna. This question is for you. Um, the experience of co-teaching sounds like a great idea, particularly with a chemist and biochemist. Did you experience any challenges in co-teaching this course? And I think it probably means either, you know, direct challenges uh, logistic-wise or, or any others. No, I think both Jeff and I were sort of just-in-time teachers, and so our styles kind of overlapped. I think we would have driven anybody else crazy, and so it's important to choose someone you like working with. <laughs> it's a good that life being said, too. I don't know yeah, what Jeff's take on this uh, is. Uh, but no, there weren't any uh, specific challenges per se. But I would have just liked to be, I think, a little bit more. Uh, there were time constraints. And so when you're only getting half a credit for a particular course, you you also don't have that much time to show up to the other person's class and and, and actually get the full uh, impact. So I would have liked to go to more of Jeff's classes and, and so on, which I wasn't able to. Yeah, great. That's great. 
Um, okay, and I've got another question coming in from, from Glenn. And I should mention, by the way, you see our next webinar um, that we have on the books here in April. It will feature Dr. Glenn Hurst out there so you can learn what's happening. They're doing quite a bit of great work out there in the UK over at York. So um, you can sign up and hear more about what they're doing. Um, but another question from Glenn. Thanks, Magna. You mentioned application with biochemists. Does anyone have experiences in teaching green chemistry topics to interdisciplinary students, biochem, natural science, in comparison to single honors chemists? And so it would be interesting to understand the differing levels of engagement of these groups or not, as the case may be. So that's, that's more of a, I think, more of a general question in, for the, uh, you know, people who are considering this. Uh, I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on that, differing majors. So. So I actually have chem majors, environmental science majors, and biotech majors in my class. Um, and, and so I think uh, it is a great way to bring these different disciplines together and actually create sort of a melting pot. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I've had environmental science students who were scared of Gen Chem 1 and 2, but they, they were more receptive of Gen of Green Chem because it was more applicable and they started to like it and see the relevance. That's great. I don't know if you had anything to add on that question, James. Well, so um, by incorporating in some toxicology and green chemistry into organic chemistry, you'll hit a large subsection of majors, uh, including chemists, biologists, nutrition, dietetics, and then as, long as, as well as the pre-med. And um, What's, what's important is if you use examples of toxicology when you're doing your organic mechanisms, it shows how organic chemistry is pertinent in the real world because that's, that's often a difficult uh, connection to make. In toxicology, I can show one mechanism to do that, whereas if I'm doing a, a multi-step synthesis, the students need to know like four different reactions to actually like make something that can cure a patient or cure a sick puppy or something. So, there's a, a special place for toxicology is in that when I show a mechanism, it's just one single example and I can show the real world application. And so that can be spread to all those majors in, in, in that case. That's a great point. Um, okay, and um, so thank you so much. That's a great point. Um, and I'm, I'm, the winner of our book is um, Sarah Jackson. So Sarah, you'll be receiving an email from us. Congratulations. Thank you so much for tuning in. And um, I just, we've gotten to the end of our questions here, and I just wanted to thank you both again for, this has been, I think, a fantastic discussion. Hopefully we've given some ideas for different models. Um, please note that if you still are tuned in here, you can grab the handouts of the both the PDFs of the PowerPoint slides are right there in, in, the, in your control panel. You can download them. Um, you'll receive an email with the recording. And I should also mention that we have a toxicology working group comprised of, of faculty and some toxicologists who tune in and chat with us on a regular basis through conference calls and, and uh, uh, we use GoToMeeting. Um, and, we're, and we're creating and we, we're, we're having a constant dialogue around integrating toxicology into chemistry courses and, and what diff you know, different resources and, and what that looks like. So you're more than welcome to join in on those conversations if, uh, if you're interested. So feel free to contact us directly about that as well. So again, thank you so much to James and Magna. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you.